We have not looked at what part of the responsibility do we share. Yes, black men sell a lot of drugs, and a lot of us black women get the money from them drugs and buy some of these fancy clothes we wear, drive around in some of these fancy cars. He is not doing these things alone and without support from us, whether they are good or bad. See, we have a lot of power. We are very strong women. I'm saying that we're using our strength in the wrong direction. We're using it to tear our man down, tear our nation down, instead of building it up. Having an education and a job is not, does not necessarily mean you have a successful life. I keep telling black women that to uh, raise a child, they say, well, I uh, provided with food, clothing, and shelter. That's not raising a child, that's maintaining one. To raise a child, you need a parental coalition of a man and a woman. We have sons who, are, by not having a father in the home, they don't know how to respect women. They take on the uh, black feminine, female emotionism. They're doubtful. They're indecisive. They can't make a decision. They don't know what to do about being a man because we can't teach them that. We don't have that knowledge. We have daughters who grew up in a home where they don't see any affection, where there's no man there. They go out into the world and try to mate. They don't have no idea how to be no woman to no man how to function in a house with a man, because they haven't seen it. Most of our children, just like us, get all the information we have about how you be with a mate off television. It's the only medium that shows us anybody being together. Those rules have not worked for us. The importance of healthy male and female relationships and black love. What are some solutions to restore the balance? Well, clearly, I mean, because the black man has been so, you know, demonized and has been seen as not necessary in the black relationship, clearly it's important. And I, I think that, you know, the plan has been to always push him away and out of that relationship. And like, I think I mentioned on one of the calls, I, I'm reading this book called The Black Macho and how from slavery on, the effort has been to create this narrative about the black man that isn't necessarily true. But when you repeat a narrative so often, like we were talking about how when you're, when somebody is telling you that something about yourself that may not be true, you start to believe it. And so, you know, viewing and, and putting this narrative out about the black man of being this, you know, either a stud or, you know, being very um, violent, that's the narrative that has been put out. And then the black man, when you hear it so often, you begin to believe that. The black woman begins to believe that society begins to believe that and then you just be it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy because you continue to hear it so much that you become exactly what they said even though it wasn't based on any truth so it's definitely important for us to start to recognize where it has come from how it was developed what it has done to us and how we need to acknowledge, you know, these things. Like we talked about acknowledgement. It's important to acknowledge so that you can move forward and move to a better place. Um, and then I think part of that too is when we talk about that divine feminine, divine masculine, is women understanding how to get back to that divine feminine place, that place where we would like to be but that we have been so accustomed to not being in. We have been in our masculine so much because men weren't in the household. Or, you know, if you needed, back in the day, you needed social services, your husband couldn't be there. You couldn't have a man in the house. If you want our money, we got to be your daddy. Not, you know what I'm saying? Or we got to be your husband. It's not going to be your man. So we have to rebuild those connections. We have to understand the value of where our black, what our black men bring to the table and how crucial it is for your black man to be in the home with your kids, raising children. And it's, you hear so often, I don't need a man, I don't need, it. that's not true. That's not the intent. If we could, if we were supposed to function like that, women would have been able to have babies by themselves. And so, 
we have to understand that and we have to learn how to get back into our divine feminine and which is a place of understanding, you know, that role and not in a way that makes you submissive to the point where you're doing anything, but understanding that, that role and not being that masculine role where you emasculate your man, which is where many of our black men, women are. We emasculate our black men all the time. And it's not because we want to, it's because we have always been taught to be these strong black women, having to fend for ourselves, having, and so out of necessity, we've taken on that role. And now we have to start backtracking and finding a way to get back to where we're supposed to be, which is a difficult place to go, but we got to figure that out. And then the black man has to learn how to walk in that role because he's been so used to not walking in that role. His mama being the strong black woman and seeing that and just being that mama's boy. you got to learn how to walk in that role. So for women to be able to relinquish some of that masculine you got to step up and be that masculine man. You have to be that person who is willing to take on that role. It can't be, I want you to relinquish your masculine, but I'm just going to be flip-flopping back and forth. You can't do that. So we both have things to do. We have to come together, figure that out, and um, understand that it, it, it's kind of that we have to come together. It's, it's some work that has to be done on both parts. I've had this conversation with some of my brothers and um, we've said exactly what you're saying amongst each other, but I have to admit that I am literally mind blown to hear those same sentiments come from a black woman. Yeah. Um, oftentimes when we have this conversation as men, especially if it's a conversation is for others to hear, we often feel like we're walking on eggshells. Mm -hmm. Like we don't want to offend women by saying some of the exact same things that you said. This, the part about men stepping up, that's easy to roll off our tongue. But when we start talking about our sisters, we really, it really, it almost creates a certain level of tension amongst us. Mm -hmm. Because nobody wants to feel like they're disrespecting black women. But at the same time, there's some of us that want to be able to say what needs to be said. Like our women have experienced, a, we have experienced a role reversal. Yeah. A lot of the, us, uh, as men, we have taken on certain feminine characteristics and our women have taken on ma uh, masculine characteristics. But all of us find ourselves sometimes hesitant or reluctant or just finding this, this conversation difficult because we don't want to offend black women because another thing there are some black women that are hurt or still feeling bitter that are quick to be reactionary at the first sign of any constructive criticism and so it becomes a very sensitive conversation so it's very refreshing hearing a black women a black woman speak these same things on her own regard like this is what you honestly think and feel it's very, um, it's very, it's very refreshing and it's very mind blowing at the same time. Yeah, it's real. I mean, and the thing about it is just like we talk about trauma, we recognize where stuff comes from, but now that we recognize where it comes from, we have to start to fix it. And, um, we understand, you know, the architects of all of this and how it kind of came together and forced us into these roles that we didn't necessarily want to be in. And some of it was self-preservation. I mean, what do you do if you are a black woman in slavery and you have to be everything for your children, the protector, the, the provider, everything, because your husband was sold to somebody else and there was nothing that you could do to, about that. So you have to step up. And so I think that we have come into this role, not because we wanted to, but because we had to. But then when we got to a place where we no longer, well, I think there were always things that were put in front of us to keep perpetuating that. So welfare. And this is why I want so desperately for Black people to stop with that. Like we go back to the Democratic Party. It is just a new age, like, 
plantation. It's always about what, oh, what can we get? Can we, you know, we got to give us something, got to give us something. You got to keep taking care of us. And I'm not saying that you don't need things and people need help. And I'm all about, I'm good with that. But we cannot continue to just look to others always for that. And that's all they've done is keep us in that, that, that perpetuated that same, the welfare, the, this, we got to give you this, we got to give you that, you know, and it keeps us in that same role. And, you know, and, and just look at it. Black women tend to be more, go to college more than their, the black man. So it's almost like by black women checking off female and black, so hitting those two minorities, they've been put in front of the black man. So when you look at households, the black woman might potentially make more than her counterpart, which already feels a certain way. And then if there are other things that happen, infidelity, other things, then you get this image of, wow, well, me, him. You understand what I'm saying? So all of these things just have created a situation where women have taken on those roles and they stand firm in those roles. I don't need no man. I can do bad by myself. I don't really, you know what I'm saying? And that is not, and I've always said this. I mean, even before I've been on this journey, Elijah, people say, I'm good by myself. I, no, that's not true. We are meant to be, we are meant to have partners. We are meant to have people in our lives, you know, and any woman who says that she don't need her man, a man, a man in her life, not that you need like in the sense of I would die without but you know we like those partnerships we're meant to be that way you know that's just that's not true it's just a way to preserve you know the feelings that you have inside to make yourself feel better about things but we just have to do something to mend that and we have to recognize the the feminine part the masculine part and not look at it as being submissive in the sense of lying down and doing anything but just understanding your role and when you are in that role you're so much more powerful than when you're out of the role and people don't understand that there's power in being in that role so they have to recognize that do you remember a, a 70s movie by the name of claudine with james Earl? Oh, absolutely when the man had to run out and the welfare was coming to the house <laughs> <laughs> the welfare was coming to check, doing the check. I made sure that man ain't there. Yes, I do remember that. And that's real. And it's real for a lot of people. And what does that do? Perpetuate the need, the, 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 the image that the man is not necessary because the government is taking that role. Taking on that role. And how many women do we have now? Who I mean, I see it so much, Ellen Aja, in the work I used to do where you have the woman working, maybe not even a, a good job, but working, having kids and having a new boyfriend. He's the one staying home with the kids, which even emasculates him even further. Because he, number one, whatever his situation was, I don't know, incarceration, can't find a job, can't find a job that would be supportive of a family bouncing from woman to woman, women feeling like it's so much. There's so many reasons that things happen, you know, women being abused and then just accepting any man, men being abused, being in trouble, not being able to find a job. And then they all come together and things just fall apart. You know, it's just, it's just crazy. And a lot of this has been by design and it has worked particularly for our families, because what I even find though, El Naj is even with, so say you look at the socioeconomic levels where maybe you might say that more poor families go through this, but white families, even who are poor, a lot of times it's two household families. It doesn't even matter. White people who are poor still have a mother and a father in the household. Doesn't matter. You can live in a single tr wide trailer with, you know, in a dilapidated state 
And somehow the, the father is there because the white women have never really had to be masculine. They've never had to take on a role. They've always been taken care of. And they still are in that role, whether they have money or not, whether they have education or not, they still have the expectation that somebody's gonna take care of them. And white men rise to that expectation and black men, it doesn't matter. Men rise to that and they take care of, they feel obligated to take care of a white woman. They don't feel the same way about black women mm. because black women don't portray themselves as needing that. You understand? So it's a double edged sword. And so it's, and it's just interesting. I, I just used to find that so interesting. Like you go into those homes and the father was there. He might've been a crack addict. He might've been on meth or something, but he's there. You see what I'm saying? He's still in the household. Us, a lot of times, Daddy, we don't even know who the daddy is. Don't know he gone. He, he's somewhere else, or he's not in the house. So he, it, it's it's always a separation. And I don't, you know, and I, I just wonder about the value. And we've we've accepted what that image of what they said our black men are. So I don't know. And it's being right now. We're seeing it now. Like every, not that people can't be with who they want. I don't have a problem with that, but you just look at how they're, now it's a black woman and a white man. That's all you see on TV now. That's all you see. Is that another way to get black women, oh, now there's a license. You're, you're, it's okay to be with a white man. Not that it was prohibited, but now it's open as acceptable. They're, every commercial. It's a black woman, a white man. So again, the black man is trying to be, they're trying to leave the black man out. There's always been an assault on the black man. What are some solutions to restore the balance? It's got to be us though, Ellen. We got to recognize it. I, I don't know what else to say. We've got to recognize what's happening. How do people recognize that? When they eat anything, they take in anything. I don't know how to, how to solve that problem because you've got to either, there's got to be something internal that tells you that switch has to be switched on to say, you got to do something better or you got to start making some adjustments. And I don't know what to say. I don't know how to convince people, but let me say this much. I have another call that I do with some of my, like my aunt, my cousins and my sister and literally, this is what we talk about. So I'm encouraged. Women are getting it because I believe that women, I don't know what it's, what's moving people. I mean, I think I do know what's moving people. We're moving in, it's a, an age of enlightenment. And so people are just naturally becoming more enlightened, but women are trying to figure it out. And hopefully black men are also trying to figure it out. So um, I do think black women are trying to figure out what's going on in their, their relationships, trying to look within to understand where they can make improvements to then improve and help their relationships with their black men. So. so how about for yourself, what would you say influence your ability to restore that balance in your personal life? Um, well, first of all, the awakening, you know, the whole awakening process and then just doing some, self-exploration and recognizing that things that I dislike the most were the things that I would bring to, to the relationship. Wow. So what I hated the most is what I drew to me. And that was my doing. It was nobody else's doing. Mm. So I couldn't just blame it on somebody else. It was all about what I was giving off. Mm. I was giving off something that was then giving me back exactly what I gave. So, so if and so understanding power, literally understanding the power you have, literally understanding you have power. Women have so much power, Ellen, as we talked about this. If women didn't date drug dealers, we wouldn't have as many drug dealers. Mm. Women have lots of power. And so you've got to just stand in your power. Mm. You got to stand in your power and recognize it. If you recognize you have power 
and you start making some changes and recognize and see that as a result of making those changes, your life changes, then you, you'll, you'll believe it. And the key thing that you said is you held yourself accountable. For it's all, it's only about us. Mm. That's it. When it comes down to it, it's literally only about the self. It's only about me, about me. Because me, I'm connected to everybody. I'm connected to you. You're connected to other people. We're all connected. So because if I can focus on me, if we all focused on us, everything would be good. So we're all impacting each other. So in other words, building yourself and mastering yourself as an individual, and then from there as a collective, you become stronger. Without a doubt. So you know how they say we're only as strong as, as our weakest link? Mm -hmm. I mean, really, it's, we're only as strong as our weakest link. It's really true. So if our weakest link, because we're all linked, we're all linked. So I can be strong, but if my weak link is weak, we're all weak. If we each build and become strong links, then we're all strong. Mm. That's all it is. It's only about us. It's only about building ourselves up and, and recognizing what we need to do, the work we need to do. And once we do individual work, then that's going to emanate to everybody else because we're going to feel confident in who, who we are. We're going to be, we're going to exude, you know, strength and positivity and kindness and love. And we're going to only get it back because people cannot, you cannot even, you know how they say you have to kill people with kindness. You have to, you have to, it really is true. You know, how do you, how will you mean towards a person who's nice? I mean, it's not, I'm not saying a hundred percent. We know we got crazy people who are deranged and who will do that. But truthfully, you'll get back what you, what you give out. And if you don't, you're still vibrating high. And you're not lowering yourself to a level to other people's level. So I think that as a collective, that's what we have to do. And I think that people are doing it. I really do. I think that as a collective, that's what's happening. I think that that's what they're, they're underestimating how many people are doing this work on themselves. And then as a result, it's, it's impacting the collective. Good point. Would you say that growing up in a two-parent household made a difference? In Absolutely. Without a doubt. My dad was there all, every, all the time. My dad was, has always been a part of my life. So I think that that has made a difference. Um, you know, in feeling safe, which a lot of women may not feel, you know, like, I've never had concerns about feeling unsafe. You understand? So, um, and he was a great provider, great dad, all of that. So clearly that made an impact on me. I mean, I, you know, just conversations we've had. And it's funny because we don't see eye to eye about politics and stuff like that now. But so much of what he said when he was younger impacted the way I think. And I've I have to tell him like sometimes like that you, you're the one who told me that how you tell me that and now you now you don't remember like you don't remember nothing you told me growing up like what happened you know so absolutely that impacted me I mean because and that's what dads don't realize fathers don't realize that children don't need money they just need time they money matters nothing to children and it's interesting because when I do the work I used to do and I used to see fathers and I realized that a lot of fathers are not around because moms make them feel less than because they're not bringing money to the table. While I understand it takes money to take care of children and mothers are often burdened with having to be the sole provider for kids. Kids need their father, whether or not he has money, but men stay away because they don't want to hear from the woman that they're not, you're not worth anything because you don't have any money to provide. You don't have any money for pampers. You don't have this. So you can't see your child because you're not coming with money. When that's a detriment to the child, children only need their dads present. They don't care about money. You know, maybe when they get a little older, when they start to hear in their, you know, the, 
well, he ain't bring that. You know, maybe it'll impact them then. But when they're growing up in those formative years, it doesn't matter. They just need fathers. And then you have, it's so crazy because then you have, it's always about money. Child support will take everything from you. Child support don't care whether or not you have a, a, a apartment, you know, you got to pay for and you got to get to work and you got to pay your car payment. They just take your money based on your gross salary as if you have no bills. So then that prevents men from being able to pay child support. Like there's just, it's all, like I say, it's just been an assault, particularly on the black man. Then you take his license if he don't pay. <laughs> so now he can't go to work. So now he really can't pay. Like what? Who, who thought of these things? Who thought of this? You know, so I don't know. I don't know. Wow. Yes, it's a, it's a lot. A lot. Good job, Beth. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> you did you did great tonight. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um this one, this one I'm walking away from feeling empowered. I'm excited. Okay, good. Yeah, I like this one. Good. You did you, you brought a lot of life to the conversation on this one. Okay, good. I'm glad. The white woman's liberation movement, we don't have anything to do with that. We have not been under the control of the black man for over 500 years. So what do we have to get liberated from them from? <laughs> they haven't been our boss. That's the white woman and her man. They're going through that and that's their business. We don't have any business being in that. They only introduced it to break down the civil rights movement. Civil rights movement started with the black man, the black woman, and the black child standing together, trying to plead for a freedom, justice, and equality, and more benefits in the country that they had had built. They threw the white woman in there with the women's liberation movement and made it a woman against man thing. That created a big separation between black men and black women because then everybody started going for self. Then they bring the welfare system in and tell us in order to feed and clothe and house our children, we have to give up our man. You have to put the man out of the house. When the white farm wife goes to the government for subsidy for the farm, they don't tell her to get rid of the farm and they keep that family together. But in the black community, they make it a requirement because they want to keep endorsing into the black community that the black man is no good and that he is not deserving of respect, he is not deserving of us letting him give us any protection or instruction and that we are better than them. <laughs> 